from the Lord when I was pastor in Julesburg, Colorado, up in the northeastern corner of the state. The Lord gave us a wonderful revival. We had services that ended at 2 o'clock in the morning. Every weekend we had people saved. And I saw the young people come to the Lord, but then I saw them kind of, uh, uh, you know, stumbling, kind of weak. And I said, Lord, how can I help them be strong uh, in the Lord and continue to, to serve you faithfully? And the Lord gave me this message. Now, last year, I preached eight sermons on this section at my church. So tonight, I'm going to give you eight sermons in... Uh, Three hours, brother? Is that okay? Now we hope to do it a lot faster than that. Open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. The epistle of Peter, chapter 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to read there beginning with verse 3 and down into verse 11. You may remain seated as I, as I read. Incidentally, I mentioned that I usually at my church, I like to come down and speak from down here and kind of be closer to everyone. Amen. And this is what the Word of God says, Second Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through this, he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may participate of the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgot that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do not, if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head for a moment as we pray? Our Father, we thank you for your presence tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your precious and wonderful word. I ask you that you would speak to each one of us. Anoint me with the Holy Spirit as I expound the word of God. And may it be a great blessing to each one this evening. And not only for this evening, but through the rest of their spiritual lives. Thank you, Father. I ask it in the name of Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I don't know how many of you are aware that uh, salvation has two sides. Oh, someone might be thinking it has a lot more sides. But I, I want to look at salvation tonight as having two sides. And that is the side that God plays in our salvation. The side that we cannot duplicate. The side that no one can uh, ever uh, take away from God to do. And then we have the side that you and I have to play in our salvation. Every story has two, sto two sides. I remember one day that my two sons were having a, a fight. I don't know, they were 10, 12. And... Uh, I thought that one of them was crying, so I went over and I was going to spank uh, the other son. And he said, wait, 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 Dad, wait. Let me explain. Let me hear the other, let, let, you can hear the other side of the story. So salvation has two sides. 
Sometimes, uh, as Christians, we begin the Christian life and we think that it's all up to God. It's all up to God to do everything. He died on the cross. He paid for our sins. He's our Savior. He's going to keep me. I'm going to get to heaven. God's going to do it. Well, that's possibly a good feeling. But there's another side. I think God has given you and I a responsibility and the part that we have to play in our salvation. So when we get to heaven, God will have done his side, and you and I we have, will have done our side. Let's take a look at what God has done, beginning with verse 3. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. With his divine power, he has given us everything we need so that we can live a Christian life. You know, we can think, well, Peter had more, Paul had more, uh, the other, the primitive Christians had more, the pastor has more, the evangelist has more. No, God has given each one of us, each one of you, everything you need to be a, a, a believer, a, a, a victorious Christian. Amen? How many believe that? Yeah. When you came to him, he gave you everything you needed. And he says, he gave it to us um, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. We, are, we can only be saved through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given unto man by which we can be saved. And it is only as we trust in Jesus, uh, as we know Jesus, that we can be saved. And so it is through our knowledge of him that we receive what we need uh, for the Christian life. So if you know Christ, if he has become your Savior, if he lives in your heart, if you know him, you possess what you need to live uh, a, a victorious Christian life. And he says, he called us by his own glory and goodness. You know, when we looked at Christ, we saw his glory, his holiness, uh, his power, his goodness, his love, his sacrifice. He said, I will be lifted up, and by that crucifixion, I will draw all men unto him. And perhaps... Uh, everyone thought that that was the end of Jesus, but that is his glory. He died for us on the cross, and by him we are attracted by that cross so that, so that we can know him as our Lord and Savior. His not glory and his goodness. There's no one as good as Jesus. And you know, the wonderful thing is that he is the same today and tomorrow and through eternity, he doesn't change. You can never go to Jesus. If you come to me, you might find me in a bad humor, you know. And maybe I won't treat you as nice as yesterday. And you might go away and say, well, I don't know about this guy, you know. But not Jesus. He's the same. He never changes. So by his glory and by his goodness, he has, we, we have been called to serve him. And through this, he has given us, through his glory and goodness, he has given us very great and precious promises. Great and precious promises he has given us. For example, given the promise that he's going to be with us. Lo, I am with you every day until the end. He's with us. That's a wonderful promise. He also made a promise. He said, I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to send you another counselor that will be with you forever. And you and I know that when we came to Jesus, this counselor, this wonderful Holy Spirit is coming to our life and has made a tremendous change. He's applied everything that Jesus did uh, into our hearts. And so through those promises, uh, we can participate in his divine nature. What, what a wonderful thought that you and I could participate in the divine nature of God. 
when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us, we participate of, of, of the nature of God. And it is only by those means, by that means, that we can escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And one other translation uh, uh, mentions and greed that is in the world. You know, th th we live in a corrupt world. I think all of us are aware. All you have to do is uh, turn the television on, hear the news, see some of the programming on television. You know we live in a corrupt world. Some of the things I'm going to say right now, may, they think it's uh, hate speech. We see marriage crumbling. We see that possibly in June we will have a decision from, from the high court that uh, same-sex marriage is okay. Uh, trying to redefine, uh, you know, the meaning of marriage. Well, go to the second chapter of Romans and you find out what's really happened here. You know, so we have a world that is corrupt, uh, extremely corrupt, and we cannot escape from that corruption. And many of you know that you were dragged along by the corruption of the world. And it is only when you came to Jesus that you were able to escape of the corruption that is in the world. That is what gives us uh, the victory. And we become partakers of his nature. Now that's God's part. Simply stated. Those things no one else can do. Only God. That's what God has done. Only he can do that. But now, for that very reason, he says, because of what God has done, make every effort to add to your faith. Now, here comes our part. God has done his, and now we have to add to our faith. You became a Christian. You received Jesus. He became your Lord, your Savior. He forgave you. He gave you the Holy Spirit. And uh, so you have now what you need to live a Christian life. And uh, now uh, we have, that's our faith. You know, we've trusted in him. We believed in him. Faith is the basis of our Christian life. If you have not received Jesus by faith, you can't be saved. So it says, for by faith are we saved through grace. And that is not of ourselves, but it is a gift of God. So God gives us the, gift, the faith, the ability to trust in Jesus. The very fact that you were able to trust in Jesus, it wasn't so much because of you, but Jesus gave you, God gave you that gift of faith for salvation. Isn't it wonderful that when we trusted him, we can be sure that we're all right because it is a gift of God and we have by faith become believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Now we have to add to that faith. Some people don't add anything. I'm saying that's it. Go to church, clap my hands, sing a few songs, give my offering, go home, and uh, never do anything to grow. And everything uh, that's supposed to grow, if it doesn't grow, it's got a problem, you know. Uh, I, I, I hope I don't offend someone, but I don't know if you've ever seen a, uh, a, a child, a person that never grew. You know they have a big head, they're grotesque. Something went wrong in the growth process. And some have, the pituitary gland went wrong and they got real big, you know, and some got real small. But if you don't grow, it, it, if a child doesn't grow, you have a little baby that's born and it's beautiful as long as it's growing. If you see something, what's, what's the matter with my baby? It's not growing. You know, you, you run to the doctor and try and find out what, what's the problem. What's the matter with those creatures that don't grow? You don't have a big head and they're a big problem and they never do anything. They don't grow and they're in danger. They not they probably won't make it. So you need to add to your faith, and the first thing you're supposed to add is knowledge. To faith you add knowledge. 
And of course, he's not saying you have to go to the university to add that kind of knowledge. It's talking, uh, talking about how uh, knowledge concerning the uh, living the Christian life. And people lack a lot of this knowledge because they don't add anything to their lives. I remember when I was pastor in Greeley, Colorado, a lady came from the church and said, well, she was uh, young, maybe 20, 25. She says, Pastor, the circus is coming into town. Is it a sin to go to the circus? And uh, the Bible talks about that, don't you know? No. She hadn't added knowledge, see. You know, the Bible talks about uh, going to the circus. The Bible talks about smoking. A lot of those things. It says over in, in, in uh, John, John says, if your heart does not condemn you, we have confidence with God. But if our heart condemns us, greater is God. So, and elsewhere it says, everything that is not of faith is a sin. And so, whatever we do, if our heart condemns us, you shouldn't do it. Amen. And if he doesn't condemn us, then we can do it. Of course, we still have the word of God uh, to guide us. But there are things that are not stated clearly in the Word of God. It doesn't say you, you can go or not go to a circus. Uh, but it says if your heart condemns you, don't go. I didn't give her an answer. I just told her that. Uh, to this day, I don't know whether she went to the circus or not. You know. Uh, but, you know, we have to grow in knowledge of the Christian faith so we know how we should behave, how we should conduct ourselves. So go to Sunday school, go to Bible studies, read your Bible, study good books, and add knowledge about your Christian life. And to knowledge, you're supposed to add self-control. What's that? You have self-control when you sit at the table and you're eating and then you're sick afterward. You didn't have any self-control. I have to confess today that uh, we went to a buffet place and after I left, uh, Brother Ray, my stomach didn't feel too good, you know. Uh, there was a little lack of self-control there, you know. But, uh, and if you do that a lot, if you live to eat instead of eat to live, you have a problem, you know. And so you need to have self-control in many areas in your life. If you cannot discipline yourself, if you cannot develop self-control, you're not going to be very useful for the Lord, and you're going to have a lot of trouble in your life. So you have to add to your faith, you have to add self-control. And to self-control, you have to add perseverance. A while ago, when I asked how many are, are here that came to that marriage seminar, no one raised their hand. I hope they're in another church somewhere, Brother Ray, and that they're still serving the Lord. But a lot of people start and they do not persevere. We need to add perseverance. Back in, uh, when I was pastor in L.A., uh, I had a lady... I'm going to give her name because she deserves it. Her name is Altagracia, Re Altagracia Reynoso. She told me a story. She said, I, I, I was in Juarez, Mexico. So that's where she was converted and where she was going to church, a church they call La Casa de Piedra in those days. I don't know whether that still exists. And he said, when I was going to that church, there were some big problems in the church. And the pastor thought that I was part of that group that was giving, making problems. And the pastor didn't want me to go to church anymore. She said, but if the pastor locked the front door, I'd come in the side door. If he locked the side door, I'd come in the back door. If he locked the back door, I'd come in through the window. I'm not going to leave the Lord. You know, we need to add perseverance, no matter what happens. If the pastor leaves, the deacon leaves, the district superintendent leaves, if everybody leaves, don't leave. Persevere, serve the Lord. He that holds on till the end will receive the crown of life. It doesn't matter if you serve him for 30 years and then fail. We need to add perseverance to our faith. And you know, that's my goal in life. I want to persevere until I'm with the Lord. 
add perseverance to your life. Then you need to add, add godliness to your faith. Godliness. I, I like the word, in Spanish it says piedad, but I like the word godliness because it gives you the idea, uh, you know, uh, that we're tr trying to be like God. That we're trying to imitate the things that God wants us to practice. And when we talk about godliness, we're talking about an attitude in which we want to please God in everything we do. That's godliness. The way you talk, you want to please God. The way you dress, you want to please God. The places you go to, you want to please God. The literature you read, you want to please God. How you relate with your wife, you want to please God. How you relate with your neighbors, you want to please God. How you drive on the freeway, you want to please God. I have a lady over there that uh, she does drive, drive real slow and she says, boy, Brother Melendez, I hope when the Lord comes in the rapture, I hope you're not driving. She thought I might stay behind, you know. Uh, so, but in everything, we need to add godliness. We need to want to please the Lord in everything we do. Oh, what a difference it would make in our churches if everyone, every pastor, every member of the church, every individual who comes in through those doors would want to please God. What a difference it would be in every church if we would add godliness to our lives. And to godliness, we have to add brotherly kindness or affection. Let me explain it this way. Some years ago, my wife was in Costa Mesa, California, in a restaurant. And while we were in the restaurant, a bear walked in. Walked right by our table and went over to another table and gave a lady a bear hug. And then the bear walked out, went right by us, walked outside the restaurant, walked right by the window where we were sitting. And by that time, she had taken her head off with a girl dressed like a bear. She got in her pickup and drove by the window, and he said, bear hugs for sale. <laughs> Affection for sale. If you can give it, pay her, and she'll go give you a bear hug. You know, it's so important. Each one of us needs to be affirmed. Psychologically, we need to be affirmed. Let's say that you came to church, and when nobody greeted you, no one spoke to you, even though you've been here for some time, and you walk out, no one looks at you, the pastor doesn't greet you, the deacons don't greet you, the ushers don't greet you, nobody looks at you, nobody says anything. You step out the door and say, what in the world happened? What's wrong with me? How come no affection? It's so important. Uh, we had a, an evangelist come when I was in Greeley uh, to give a revival. And during that time, they also, he, he gave us some experiences to the ministers. He said they used to have a prison ministry. They would go to the prison and take a team to uh, minister to the prisoners. And they would stay in the prison compact, uh, uh, complex uh, for a week. And he says, one of those times a man came over and he said, sir, can you give me a hug? I've been here 13 years and no one has ever given me a hug. You know, the church is a place where we should receive hugs and good handshakes and smiles and we should be that kind of person. Add brotherly affection to your life. That's very important. And so what might we thinking? Yeah, but you don't know some persons I know. I wouldn't do that. Well, then you can solve the problem. Add love. That's what he says. Agape love. Agape love doesn't expect anything in return. There's a little poem, uh, a little poem in Spanish that speaks about a bubbling stream you know, where the water is bubbling out of, a, uh, um, uh, out of the rock. And he says, anyone can come and drink 
from that. Hey, you know, when we have agape love, death like the God of love. Christian, Christ came, didn't expect anything from anybody. The Son of Man came to say, seek and save that which was lost. If you look Isaiah, if you read Isaiah 53, you read that they didn't appreciate him very much. They didn't like him very much. They finally crucified him. They didn't love him, but he came to give us love. That's agape love that doesn't expect anything in return. It's just willing to give that love. No matter how they treat you, no matter how they make you feel, love them. And uh, that will be fulfilling what God wants from us, that we should add agape love. And that will help us to become uh, uh, perfect in the, in the love of God. So here we have, we have goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love to our faith. And what do we receive for that? Well, first of all, it's just part of our Christian life. That's what we need to do. But what do we get back? Most of us like benefits, right? Uh, we like to know what benefits we're going to receive from anything. Someone was telling me this morning, he says, uh, I've been paying on my insurance and I went for a certain test and I had to pay a lot of money. Well, where does my money go? I'm giving money, paying money on insurance and I'm getting nothing back from it. You know, what do we get back if we add these things to our Christian life? Well, let's look what Peter says. He says, if you possess these qualities in, listen, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your spiritual life. What are you doing for the Lord? Are you doing something? Are you accomplishing something? Are you effective at something? You know, it, it's a matter of, uh, of doing something for the Lord. And when we have these qualities, these virtues in our lives, it will stir us and help us to do something for the Lord. If you're not doing anything, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Add these things to your life and you'll begin to do something. You will be effective. You will do something for the Lord. It may be small. Some people just don't do anything. Well, I'm, you know, they don't elect me to be a deacon. I'm not going to do anything, you know. And no, uh, whatever the Lord wants you to do. I'll never forget uh, back in uh, the last century. When I gave a revival in Chihuahua, Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, the dirts were floor dirts. The floor were dirt, you know. And incidentally, at that time, I knelt down to pray. There were so many flies, by the way. And I was praying, I went, <laughs> down went the fly. <laughs> but I remember that in something else. There was a man. By looking at his face, he uh, perhaps was a little retarded. But he had a ministry. He would come early to church, take a can with water, and he would go around, you know, wetting the dirt so that when the people came, it would not be dusty. And then he would dust with a, with, with a broom. And uh, you think he's going to get a reward? He's going to get a reward. He was doing something for the Lord. Amen. Do something for the Lord. If you add these things to your life, you will become effective and useful in, in the work of the Lord. Then he says, um, going down to verse 10. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling an election sure. When we do these things, when we add these things to our life, then you will make your calling an election sure. Many are called, but not everyone makes it. And so if you add these things, you will make your calling 
an election sure. Okay? That's a wonderful thing. That's wonderful. That's, that's a tremendous guarantee. If I add these things, my calling an election is sure. That means someday, for sure, I'm going to walk the streets of gold in the New Jerusalem. You know, because I've done uh, what Peter is recommending as an apostle that we should do. And then one more thing. For if you do these things, over there they had it different. If you do these things, you will never stumble. I like it, you will never fall. If you do these things. You know, Calvinists, uh, they talk about perseverance, uh, but they also talk about uh, predestination. You persevere if you're predestined to be a Christian. That's not the way we believe the Bible teaches. You know, but we have assurance here. If we add these things to our lives, we will not fall. Amen? Amen? So we can rest assured, if I do these things, I will not fall. And I always recommend this message, I like to read this once in a while and check myself whether I'm doing those things, whether I'm adding those things to my life so that I can be assured of my calling and my election. And then one more benefit, a beautiful one. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow! That means that if Peter is the one that has the keys, when he sees you coming and he knows that you kept the word that he recommended, he's going to say, roll out the red carpet, open the gates wide, here comes someone that obeyed the word and he's made it to heaven. And so we will receive a rich and abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Two sides of salvation. He has done his part. And now you and I need to add to our faith. And if we do, the benefits are incomparable. Amen. So, can you praise the Lord with me? Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Amen. If you and I do these things, <clears throat> see you in heaven. Well, God bless. I want you to stand. You know, what an awesome, awesome truth. Because how many know we're living in a day and in an hour where there are a lot of people stumbling, a lot of people falling. 